cacao also has a spirit, a very, very powerful, nurturing one. And it's not masculine nor feminine. It can show up for somebody in any way, just like spirits don't have a gender disposition. They can show up in any way that we need. Same thing with cacao. Hello, everybody, and welcome to the Food Matters podcast, your home for nutrition, health, and wellness education. My name is Laurentine. I am a filmmaker and a nutritionist and the founder of foodmatters.com, and I'm here to hold your hand on this journey to optimum health, transformation, and emotional healing. Hello, hello. Peace and blessings, Food Matters family. Good to have everyone here again listening. And um, I'm very excited to be joined today by a brother from another mother. because He gets it. He gets it. <laughs> so, yes, I'd like to tell you a little bit about Brendan, Brendan Jarrell, and, um, and then we can get started with some questions. So from professional athlete to teaching physical education in East Africa, Brendan Durrell's journey has led him on a mission to coach others in taking back control of their own lives. His life's work is now as an intimacy expert, a lifestyle coach, and tantra guide. Several years ago, he embarked on a journey with intentional cacao, the catalyst for expanding his heart and unlocking a transformation that led him to do the work that he's doing today. So welcome to the studio, Brendan. So good to have you. Thank you for having me in the beautiful introduction. I'm really excited to be here because not only that food matters, but I'm also a Taurus moon. So food is all that matters to me. <laughs> mm, I love it. So it seems like you're in a place right now that you are really truly living your, pas your passion and your purpose and you're inspiring others to do the same. But what got you to this point? I'm sure there's a beautiful story behind that. Yeah, I would say in simple terms, it's it's just wanting to feel good as consistent as possible. Um, that's been always my goal, and that's been my um, what I want for myself and desire for myself, and also for the people around me. Um, just feeling well, like wholesome. You know, it's a lot of people that I've come across. Let's say in the spirituality realm, they try to access something and and leave themselves, leave this planet, and leave Mother Earth to go somewhere else. And I'm like, but it's so beautiful here, you know? And so my, my thing is to just live as wholesome as possible right here and right now. And tell us about your background, how you got started. You're an athlete and you must have gone through a lot of experiences to bring you to this space where you can heal, lead, guide others. Yeah. Many rites of passages via the sports world. Um, I played baseball for 22 years I um, I also was blessed to play professional baseball for four years out of those 22, and it was the driving force in my life. It was the the vehicle that um, one it, it it put me in positions to face myself, to to commit to something, commit to a level of excellence, physically, mentally, um, emotionally, with trying to climb the ladder in sports. And when I was done playing in the States, I ended up playing internationally. I got to play in Australia, I got to play in Germany, I got to play in Japan. And that really started me on like the, the travel wagon, like going around and experiencing different cultures, different foods, different ideologies, theories, and, and all the things. So um, it's so many layers to, to how I got to where I'm at now. But I would say the sports was my vehicle that got me to where I am now in this uh, spiritual walk of mine. And we, we are speaking about spirituality. I mean, was this something that you had an intention to work on when you were a young boy, when you were an athlete? Or is that word only just come into your vernacular just recently? Yeah, there was always a level of belief of something larger than me. Um, I always felt like I was an apple from a tree, but I never knew what the hell that tree was, always just seeking. And uh, my family, my mother is of Puerto Rican descent. She's from Puerto Rico. And uh, my father is African-American. So I have a, a Baptist slash Catholic background on both ends. So my reference to God or something larger than I was, was always that, 
Um, my family never pressured me to go to church. It never did any of that. However, that was my reference point. So I always had this belief instilled in me that there was something out there. And it wasn't until I began to really travel that it started bringing it out of me of like, wow, this place is so beautiful. The people are so beautiful. And there has to be more than what I think I know at this moment. So I would say the, I'm going to call it the staring up and looking at the moon aspect of my spirit was always there, even at a young age. You know, I feel that we are as humanity right now, we're all awakening. There's a lot of us, you know, finding more passion. They're finding more purpose in the things that really, you know, makes our heart tick and what makes our heart go and get excited about life. And I think that's a really nice movement. I call these awakenings, but there's a lot of people going through different types of shifts where they're like, no, I can't do this anymore. You know, no more than nine to five or no more this toxicity or no more this, this pain and suffering. I'm, I just want something that feels good. Right. And this movement towards following our passion, towards following our purpose, it is something that, you know, we need to work on. We need to, to, to navigate. And um, it feels like what you're doing right now is you're leading people towards that as a life, like you call yourself a lifestyle coach. What, what type of work do you currently do where you're able to, to help people through these types of transitions? Yeah, it's, it's um, actually, it has a lot to do with food, which is the, the alignment and the synchronicity of just being on this podcast with you. It's, um, we're always doing something, communing with spirits if we're attuned to that and if we want to. And specifically with foods, like when we use herbs, when we use different things, those are all from plants and those all have plant spirits. Does Those have energies attached to them. Um, there's a reason why certain foods and dishes are just so nostalgic because also the energy imprint of that herb, that plant is also in your dish and you're eating that. You're taking the energy in. So with, uh, with, supporting people with lifestyle and wellness, it's not just one thing. Like it's, I know many people who are very strong in their prayer for their lives, but they don't take care of their bodies. Like they, they don't, they don't do, they don't focus on gut health. They don't focus on um, environments. They don't focus on getting sun, like all the things that, that make us feel strong, like a strong human. And with lifestyle, it's just literally looking at your lifestyle. Like, how are you living your life? Like, like, what are you doing? Are you waking up at, at 7 a.m. and the first thing you do, you grab your phone and you're scrolling, looking at what other people are doing? Like, what are you commanding for your day, the night before and in the morning? And these are the things that I look at because if we can command who we are and how we're walking, this strengthens our connection to God, to whatever you deem as God and and you believe in. It's it's like strengthening the, the Wi-Fi signal to God when we clean up the environment and our lifestyle around our walk. Mm, that's so beautiful. I mean, here as our Food Matters motto and, and the way that we always talk is food is medicine and food is better medicine than drugs. And, you know, we're currently facing an epidemic of people turning to doctors, giving their power away, going into the medical system, going into the pharmaceutical system as a turn to for any type of, you know, illness, pain, suffering. How, what is your approach and how is it different how does that differ from the way we're handling it as a society? Um, for me, I, um, I, I, I see everything that I do. It's, it's, it's either going to strengthen my connection or it's going to weaken my connection in regards to how I want to feel and also my experience with um, a, a higher power. And when it comes to foods, it's my, through my, um, my African roots, my, my family's tradition going back is Yoruba Ifa. And in Yoruba Ifa, it's all about the land. It's about nature. It's about um, how we live with character and integrity. And there's so much emphasis on herbs. And this system goes back thousands and thousands of years. It even survived the, the transatlantic slave trade, like this, this, this system, this belief system. And the root of it is, is herbs and connection to Mother Earth. So holding in regards, in high regards, all the things that grow from Mother Nature, all the things that come up, like to me, that is medicinal. Like even here, it's like I have my cacao, which we're going to talk about here. And I also drink my cacao and I take my my spirulina, like just for optimization with, with myself and 
also, as I take spirulina, understanding that I'm also communing with the spirit of the ocean because that's where the algae grows. And, uh, and, and just being in, um, in this space and this mindset to me is how I keep my, my wellness up. I do believe in aspects of Western medicine. Like I believe it's an amazing tool. It's an amazing thing if it, we're in dire need. But the way that I see health overall is that we have these natural things to eat from Mother Earth. And it's about not just taking things to feel better, but it's like microdosing them every day. Uh, some days I'm going to eat more oregano. Some days I'm going to eat more parsley. Some days I'm going to eat more of this. And it's it's about microdosing Mother Earth's remedies all the time, not just turning to them when we feel ill, but making a lifestyle out of it. So that's my approach to, um, let's say, lifestyle and wholeness when it comes to wellness. Wow. Yes, you're talking my language. Um, you actually have been to the island that we live in. It's it's called Vanuatu, and it's a little dot in the middle of the Pacific Ocean. And it's got a community that still reveres Mother Earth and very much looks after it in, in a very sacred way, in the way that they, they grow their food and it's all natural. They don't allow any chemical fertilizers or pesticides to come in the country. It's very organic and permaculture farms where you actually see the way that they cultivate the land is, is very harmonious. And so the way that people think about the land is very similar to your ethos and the food that you grow. It's like... I remember meeting an, an, a, a spiritual indigenous um, elder, and he said, every day we're taking from the land, however, we forget to plant back to the land, right? He's like, what about the food that you eat? You take, you take, you take. But, you know, he was very big on every day finding something to plant. You know, if you ate some spring onions, get the root of that little spring onion that you just cut off and you know, grow it back into the ground. And it's like, oh, yes, we forget where our food comes from, right? We forget, oh, we don't just go to the supermarket. Like, no, it comes from the earth. And that reverence, it's, it's, uh, it's definitely something I'm super passionate about as well. But now that we're on the topic of cacao, tell us how that you got into cacao. And then we want to know how you use it yourself and, and, and how we can as well and why. Yeah, so cacao, it's it's we would need a whole nother Food Matters podcast to even touch the tip of the iceberg of how amazing this um, this yeah. food is, as well as the spirit that's attached to it. Right. Um, it's it's so amazing, and I also know that on the side when we were speaking, like you understand and like you love cacao as well. Um, but cacao, I first got into it. It's like I've always been a chocolate lover, like grade A boy who just loved chocolate. Like that was just me. Like give me all the chocolate ice cream, the chocolate cakes. Don't give me none of that like vanilla stuff. Just give me chocolate. And so I always had a love for it. And um, it wasn't until about a decade ago, I uh, I booked a, a random trip to Guatemala um, because I'd never been down there to Central America at the time. And a few days before I went to a sound healing um, by a friend and they served this drink that was, in my opinion, so terribly tasting. Looked like chocolate, but it just was so awful. It was so bitter. And I was like, ugh, never again. And then I had this amazing experience <laughs> with, um, with an Aboriginal instrument, the, the didgeridoo, and with some other instruments. And it was playing over my heart. I remember just feeling like this resonance, like this rrr, 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 thing happening to me after I drank the cacao and then with the instruments. And I was like, what in the hell? And when I went to Guatemala a few days later, my friend saw that I was there, the, the guy who led the experience. And he was like, hey man, um, I see where you are. You know that drink that you had before we had the sound healing? I actually got it from where you are right now. And I was like, really? He goes, yeah, there's this little like this little porch. Go over there to this porch and go go meet this man and then these these, these indigenous people and say that I sent you. So I just found my way over there. You know, it's, it's it's Central America, Guatemala in the highlands. There's no addresses, pins, GPS. I had to like literally look for, just like Vanuatu, I had to look for the pineapple tree and turn left and look up at the, <laughs> at the like the bush that has like le uh, red on it. It was like one of those experiences. No street. No streets. No, it's no streets. It's just like people and stands and that's it. And um and so I got there and then I said, such and such sent me. And I came here just to drink some cacao and just and, and buy some. And the man was so gracious and he was amazing. And he goes, absolutely. He gave me some. 
had a powerful experience on his porch just by drinking cacao. And, and I saw how he served it. Um, it tasted the same way, very bitter, very, very strong. Um, and it did something to me the same exact way it did when I went to that sound healing with this time without the instrument. So I was like, okay, I think it's, it's this thing. It's not just the instruments that yeah. brought up that feeling for me. So that sent me down the rabbit hole of cacao spiritually. And what it did, I would say on a esoteric level was that it created a foundation for me. It created a, a routine, um, a commitment that I, I brought some back with me to the States and I drank it every single morning for about, um, I would say four months. And I would just sit with it and nothing else. And I started realizing that it was allowing me to access uh, a type of numbness that I was having in my body, a type of dis, uh, disassociated feeling that I was having. And I remember just drinking it at times and just having visceral reactions where I started tearing or I just started feeling super like um, like a different kind of love within myself. And, emotional. Yeah. Yeah, emotional. Yeah. And from that moment on, I just became, I would say, an aficionado, a steward of of this great medicine. And it was even before I knew like the history about it with how the, the ind indigenous cultures used it and worked with it. I just knew I was like, this is one of my medicines. I was just certain. So for those that are listening and that are quite new to this conversation on cacao, so cacao is actually the active ingredients of cacao are, are, are uh, they're bioflavonoids and they're able to, to stimulate part of our brain that releases serotonin and feel good hormones, right? So that's why we turn to cacao when we're not feeling good. And all of a sudden, like, look at us, we're lighting up talking about cacao because we know how it feels, right? It's certain sense in our body. And so, yes, in regards to the types of triggers that it allows in our heart, how does it actually work? Because I also do, I leave cacao ceremonies, I do sound healing. And the reason why I feel that there is such an impact with people afterwards and when they come to me and say, I don't know, something just changed inside of me, something opened up. What would you say from a spirituality now that you're an uh, initiate, what would you say is th this inside the cacao or the spirit of cacao that would lead us to this, this opening? Yeah. And there's, there's so many things that I can share about what can go into the experience of somebody feeling wholesome and whole after experiencing cacao. Um, but first, with just the, for the foodies out there with the biological um, impacts of cacao, it's, um, as you mentioned, high flavonoid. Um, it's a vasodilator. Um, it's, it's literally an aphrodisiac in its purest form. And... Um, our culture and society attributes af being an aphrodisiac to sexuality and to like, oh, we only buy a box of chocolates for Valentine's Day. It's aphrodisiac or oysters, et cetera. But the true usage of, of um, aphrodisiac, if we are intentional about it, is the self-inquiry aspect. It's that it's putting us in this loving state literally, biologically, with these compounds and chemicals, not to mention it's, it's loaded with iron, magnesium, and, uh, and it's, it's supporting our whole experience in our body so that we can rest into our nervous system. We can rest into the sympathetic part that might be coiled up. So from a biological level, it's offering us support that way, just as a superfood, like a super, superfood. And then spiritually, we're in this space where um, Mesoamerican cultures have worked with the spirit of cacao for, for thousands and thousands of years um, as a deity, um, as for fertility and the specifically the Mayans, they, in their cosmo vision, they say they're the people of the corn. They come from the corn and corn is very old and it's revered and highly regarded in these um, communities. And they say that the cacao has been around as long as corn, which says it's a really, really old food. And then based on science and other things, it says the cacao tree is millions of years old, very ancient. So if we take the same mindset that we spoke about earlier, as I mentioned with um, when we cook a, a meal, like we're using oregano, we're using this, everything has a spirit. 
cacao also has a spirit, a very, very powerful nurturing one. And it's not masculine nor feminine. It can show up for somebody in any way, just like spirits don't have a gender disposition. They can show up in any way that we need. Same thing with cacao, but it's nurturing. So when you mix the superfood compound aspect and then you mix the the, the energetic components of this like very resilient tree, this food, you had it makes for a powerful experience, no matter what you're leading with it. Mm, I, I love this conversation. And, and let's bring it back to um, the issues that we're dealing with in our modern society and how this plant could help. So we're dealing with a lot of, um, I would say, addictions, um, addictions to alcohol, diff- addictions to different types of drugs, I would say street drugs even, you know, where people are just like, I need to get out of my body. I need to get out of this this pain and I'm just turning to something. You mentioned before about how you sat with cacao, you sat with plant medicine and you consumed that every day and you allowed that to be infused in your body. Can you give advice or some consultations for somebody that's working currently, that's dealing with addictions and are dealing with the pain and suffering of what we call third dimension, the world that we live in? What would you say in regards to those that are dealing with those issues? What would you give advice on? I would say that having a cup of cacao and specifically without any sweeteners, without anything added, just warm water with cacao mixed up or blended up as is, um, it creates a pause in your life, a very healthy pause. Um, I have really close friends and family members who are addicts and are in recovery. And the name of the game as they went through AA, they would say, it's like, you're always going to be an addict. That's what they say to like the people. They say, you're always going to be an addict. You know, it's about what are the things you're going to be addicted to? Like, is it what kind of lifestyle? So I would say with cacao, um, it offers that pause and self-reflection. And even if it's for five minutes drinking the cup, like you're loading yourself with these superfoods and you're, you don't even have to do anything. It's about just drinking it and giving yourself the space just to breathe and be like, okay, like this is what we're doing. It's really challenging for many people to just sit and stare at a wall. One of my teachers always encourages to try to watch grass grow if you're in nature, as long as you can. As long as you can, can try to watch grass grow. Try to watch a blade of grass grow and see how far you get. First time I tried it, didn't last 10 seconds before my mind went somewhere else because I started chasing like a dragonfly. But it's like, watch that grass grow. So cacao in its own right is is an opportunity to watch the grass grow because most of the problems that we have, it's not because we can't solve them, it's because we're not giving us ourselves space to be able to solve them or to at least feel a different way about them. That's really beautiful. Like you're saying, it's so important for us to see perspective, to get that reverence and to be able to see that there is a way out. We're never stuck. We're never, you know, this feeling of, of, of fog. You know, we never have to experience that once we allow ourselves that clear path. So, and, and that, I feel like that food does that. You know, food is usually the way in for a lot of people. You know, it's whether we're dealing with, with heart issues or heartache, or we're dealing with emotional or mental issues, or we're dealing with, you know, chronic conditions. Food is usually the way in. Right. And, and can you tell us a little bit more about what you would prescribe and what you help people with in regards to food and what type of philosophy around food that are people dealing with with illness and chronic fatigue or chronic problems in the gut? Yeah, I I'm one of the big advocates. Like I love supplementation with high quality supplements, even if you're eating wholesome organic foods that you grow or you're from the farmer's market, I still highly encourage supplements high quality supplements because um, let's face it as well, the soil isn't the same that it was when it was a hundred years ago, 200 years ago, a long time ago. It wasn't, it's not the same. So a lot of the minerals and things that's in the soil is not the same. So let's say my ancestors, when they would eat a yam, it was way different of eating a yam than it's the one we can get in the grocery store now um, based on the density of of the, the nutritional components. So I always encourage supplementation and and also consulting a health coach, health professional, just to see like what we're lacking, what we're not lacking. Um, and when it comes to food, it's like I focus on the gut. 
like so much. Like uh, gut health is everything to me because um, I've seen people reverse depression, reverse anxiety, all the things just from supplementation and focusing on their gut biome. Literally, is that like like waking up in the morning eating. You know, if um, eating some sauerkraut with some spirulina and some cacao, and then literally changing their body's composition and how they think based on feeding their gut biome. Because as you're familiar too, it's like I feel we don't put enough emphasis on the eighty twenty in our gut, the the eighty twenty, the eighty good and the twenty bad, and like we don't allow them to, let's say, spar enough the eighty to go against the twenty, and the ratio is a kind of like messed up. We need the the twenty percent. Um, "Quote unquote bad gut uh, biome to to keep us healthy and strong for the for the outside threats." So for me, it's like it's a privilege to be in a space in my life where I can freely pray and walk my life and give reverence to to this world to to um to to nature. And it's like my responsibility as well is also to keep my body in shape and keep my temple in shape. Like as simple as that. Um, have you seen the the news docu series? On Netflix, the the Blue Zone, the hundred, the Blue Zone. It's like live to a hundred. I have just I've just started watching. It. It's, yeah, it's really good. It's yeah. really good. Yeah, and it's like those things too, like the quality of the things we're putting in our bodies, and then not just eating it, but it's like how it's prepared. There's conversations happening with family. Um, there's laughter happening. Like all these things matter going into a meal. I always say to everybody when I'm in. Latin America, I literally, um, the food to me tastes, tastes different. Like when I come back to the States, like it feels dead to me. Like I don't go to restaurants when I'm in the States because the food just doesn't feel alive to me. Um, I always encourage my clients to, to eat alive things, eat things with a lot of solar energy, things that needed a lot of sun to grow, direct sunlight. Like it's so important. You take that energy into your body as well. So those are some things that I use like overall, but I'm big on um, eating live foods and eating very fresh foods um, and also a very well-balanced diet. Like me personally, I'm not a vegetarian. I'm not a vegan. Um, I eat very similar as I can to what my DNA calls for, what my ancestry is. Um, I would say I'm 80-20, similar to a chimpanzee, which is like, you know, our closest relatives in the kingdom besides fungi. But 80-20 is what I strive for, 80% plant-based and 20% meat products and things. So yeah, just wholesome, you know, and variety, a variety of things. So not everybody that's listening has probably gotten so, such a beautiful cultural back background as you in regards to food. And a lot of us, you know, still wake up and have cornflakes for breakfast and have a croissant or a ham and cheese sandwich for lunch and maybe some pasta and steak for dinner. And, you know, these type of foods are very foreign to a lot of people, I would say, that are sort of used to this type of diet that they've received from their parents. They see it on the supermarket shelves. They see it in restaurants. It's the first, th first and foremost thing that you can buy when you go to any type of restaurant or diner. So how do, we, how do we encourage people to eat these type of foods? I mean, I love that you're saying eat live foods, but what sort of, what would consist a meal for you? Like what would a lunch or a delicious lunch meal consist of for you? Yeah. So for me, um, I do my best not to eat any foods from the middle aisles in the grocery store. Um, things that are packaged and meant to last for a long time. Um, I, uh, I, I don't do that. And, and also it's like, I understand too that I'm in a place of um, privilege and also because I worked hard for it, but I'm in a space where I can choose to buy farmers grown cucumbers, carrots. Um, I'm in, I'm in, I'm actually in Vancouver right now. So the berry game out here is amazing. Like the, the best strawberries and raspberries, organic, and I've ever had in my life, peaches. So I'm grateful that I can make those choices. I, I grew up in a inner city, New York. So my family was also of that. It was canned foods, box foods, cereals, sugar cereals, um, heavy Puerto Rican food, rice and beans, pork chops. Like it was all those things. 8 p.m. at night, eating seconds and thirds and all that. Um, but the way that I, my mindset that shifted right? me, <laughs> yeah, uh, my mindset that shifted me was that literally whenever I'm eating, it's either adding long life or taking life from me. And some people can see that as radical, but that's literally what I say. And it doesn't mean that at times, like I'll still, I just had a, I had, I made my own homemade ice cream cookie sandwich uh, today 
before this podcast with like uh, with with dairy free ice cream and 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 gluten free cookies, and I smashed it. Like that was literally my meal before this podcast. And it's like I understand that that's not moving the needle for me, but I also know that I did the best that I could in that moment to make it as wholesome as possible. That I could still enjoy myself, and then. Now, after this call, I'm going to have the bison meat, the buffalo that I have in the freezer with some bolognese, you know, so just making really smart choices and also still being flexible and living my life. But can I make the best out of the situation is what I always say, you know, like when I played professional ball, they would give us uh, meal money, give us allowance per day per diem to eat food and they would stop at truck stops. And it's like, you know how it is in Australia with like the meat pies and all those things. And it's like, oh, there's nothing here. So what can I do in this moment? Like what can be the best option for me? Um, And I always just look at the labels. You know, I actually just get down and be like, okay, both of these are terrible options, but which one's the better of the two? (laughs) And that's how I, I used to go about it until I got into a place where now in my life, it's if there's two terrible options, I'll just say I'm gonna fast until later. Mm. This is a really meaningful conversation. I'm sure that you guys are enjoying it as much as I am. And I love that you're saying, you know, that we have options every day and we vote with our shopping cart and we vote with the food that we put in our mouth, right? So we're going to just shift the conversation a little bit um, in regards to where you touched on before in regards to how when you had a deep conversation and a deep experience with intentional cacao, it wasn't our heart opening, but it also allowed you as an aphrodisiac it also allowed you to tap into deeper spirituality with yourself and intimacy and um i'd love for you to explain a little bit to our audience about how we can access that not everybody has access to cacao and these type of heart opening experiences but in regards to intimacy and connecting back with our heart what would be the way that we can approach that and get there like you did yeah, cacao was the biggest tool that allowed me to, I would say, um, unnumb myself from a lot of things. When we can get into different conversations about why would I even be numb, you know, and it's like there's so many reasons why. And but cacao gave me, uh, I would say, a softening. It allowed me to soften, and not soften in a way where it's like I lose my structure, but soften in a way of receptivity, and 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 being able to listen to my intuition and hear myself say things like, hey, you really don't feel good. Like there's so many times even with my athlete mindset that I didn't feel good, but I was still pushing. And that was at a detriment to me. And now it's like cacao gave me an opportunity to actually listen to my body, to to feel it. Um, Because it gave me a gauge as well. Because the feeling that I get from drinking pure intentional cacao, um, it's like, wow, I can feel like this in my daily life if I do A, B, or C consistently. Um, It's really good for that. And also something I would like to say as well is that we spoke about addictions earlier. And um, for me, it's like I've had times in my life where I'm addicted to, to processed sugar naturally, like a lot of people are. I'm addicted to processed sugar. And Cacao has also helped me literally like kick out the sugar, like bust it out of my life because like I went on a little dieta of cacao. A dieta is just a diet. It's a Spanish word for diet. And I would drink um, pure cacao um, without any sweeteners in it. It's super bitter and very strong. And I always realized that it reset my palate. Every time I do cacao without sweeteners, it resets my palate and then I don't crave processed sugar as much anymore. That. That is so interesting for a culture that, you know, as we are, we're addicted to to coffee and, and it doesn't just stop with coffee. It's also the sugar and then the milk or any types of forms or froth that we'd like to dress our coffee up. But imagine if we're swapping that out for raw or, I mean, just straight cacao, as in like you, how do you create, how do you make this at home? Yeah. So the first thing I would say too, like it's a great replacement for coffee. I used to work with many people from Silicon Valley and they were like boutique, hipster, coffee, Kickstarter kind of guys and, and women who would just like pound coffee throughout the day. Like the coffee that's all fancy, that comes to a little glass tube, you know, that kind of coffee. That was like their thing. And I was like, okay. Um, <laughs> um, and I would switch them off of it. And the thing is too about cacao, 
um, the one that I work with and the one that I source through my cacao project, it's about less than 50 grams of ca caffeine per cup, which is um, like a cup of decaf coffee. And so even though it's way less than coffee, like the the caffeine imprint, you're still going to feel energy from all the minerals, the the nutrition in it with the vasodilation, with the... Um, with the anandamide, which scientists call the bliss molecule. Um, and you're going to feel all these things without a crash. So just keep in mind for anybody who's going to start their journey with cacao, um, I do recommend it's like moderation with anything else because you still can burn out your adrenals if you drink too much of this um, food as well, because it is an imprint on your on your body. However, um, getting back to the to the question about cacao and, and, and um, how I prepare it, um, I just, it depends on where I'm at in my season. Like, let's say this week I've been doing it with, um, warm water. I've been doing it with a little bit of cinnamon, canela, and then a little bit of cayenne pepper, and then a tiny bit of honey. And then there's other weeks where I will just do water and cacao, other weeks like that. So I don't get too fancy with it. It depends on you. Um, and it depends on purposes too. If you're in a space where you want to commune, with your own spirituality, commune with the spirit of cacao, I recommend just warm water and then the cacao, nothing else. Because in the mindset that everything has a spirit, the more stuff we add to the cup, the more, let's say, distortion is going to be in the cup to, to just be with cacao. Because if you're putting the spirit of cinnamon in, the spirit of oat milk, the spirit of uh, coconut milk, uh, cayenne, uh, so on, you know, we're putting a lot of stuff in there. So um, simplicity is is bliss. That's what I always say. Um, but yeah, it's, it's really simple. It's just some warm water and not to boil it as well. A lot of people overcook their cacao. It's the same mindset with vegetables. Like we're not going to boil vegetables at a hot temperature because we're going to kill the nutrients inside of it. Just same thing with cacao. You don't want it to be in a rolling boil. It's just warm water. Let it melt. Mix it up. Drink it. That's beautiful. Okay, so what about if we just go to the grocery aisle and we look for cacao? We, you know, we come across the Cadbury's brand and all the different types of, you know, Hershey's or brands that are out there. Where does cacao actually come from? Because my question regarding that is, if I go, I live here in Vanuatu, and if I go to the outer islands, the traditional people have never really used cacao. However, the colonizers, the ones that came here from Europe, mm -hmm. they actually decided to plant the cacao plant here in this island. And it's, you know, you can fly over in those, those cute little small planes and you could be like, whoa, what's that? It's like cacao plantations. It's a massive, you know, copra, cacao, and like coconut plantation on the right, and then cacao plantations on the other side. So how does that affect the spirit of, of the cacao, that, the fact that it wasn't indigenously planted here? And, and then going back to the question of where do people source this from so that it's not just from giant factories that have been like harvesting these cacao beans from all over the world? Yeah, it's a great question. And I'll start with the, the second question in regards to um, how does it impact like the, the quality of the cacao? Hugely, like it impacts the quality. Like it's like our records and science and history goes back to... Uh, um, and we spoke about this as well on the side in regards to Mesoamerican cultures actually cultivating and using cacao. Cacao grows really beautifully on the equator line, no matter where it is around the world. Vanuatu, the same anywhere. So it can grow there. But specifically usage, like let's say we're talking about plant medicines. It's like ayahuasca that grows in the Amazon is going to be way different than ayahuasca that grows on Vanuatu or in Byron Bay, Australia. And it's going to be a very different energetic imprint. Um, quality will still be the same depending on the how it's produced. You know, like we have to also keep in mind that sometimes a lot of these plantations and places, they'll use um, pesticides and insecticides to like, to keep stuff off of them. Um, that's why it's very important to source from uh, a regenerative um, space, or let's say in a case of Vanuatu, it's like, um, it's illegal to bring in outside pesticides. So it's like, you know that you're good there um, with that. But it's, it's very like, um, it's potent getting it from cultures that have been working with it for thousands of years. With the boom of cacao, it's like you see it everywhere. You go to Bali, you go to here, you go to there. And it's like you see cacao, cacao ceremonies. But the actual thing about cacao is that it was never a ceremony. Like, like in, in Mesoamerican cultures, they never had cacao ceremonies like around the drink, which is what people don't understand. Um, let's say specifically Mayans, where I learned a lot of the the respect and reverence through cacao in Guatemala, 
it's they'll offer the the shells of the beans to the sacred fire. They'll do ofrendas. They'll have a little bit of cacao. There's a deity as well that's associated with cacao. But there was never like an actual ceremony for cacao. That's more of like a new age thing that came into the space. Um, and also to note that the Mayans, when it comes to drinking cacao, Mayans are masterful at womb work, like for women. And even like I've had um, worked on my stomach with like trauma and things like these temescal. You go into a temescal and you get in like your belly massage. Powerful. And they're known to like when women are in labor and giving birth, they actually sip cacao as well because of the energy imprint and the, what it does to the body. So very layered and we can talk more about it. Um, but I would say like cacao is a spirit as a whole, very potent because I would just say, just get it into your diet regardless. Now, when it comes to the big corporations like the, the Cadbury's, the Nestle's, the Mars, blah, 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 I would personally um, look for fair trade at worst and at best direct trade sources that you can get cacao from. Um, and it's very intricate in the process because um, giving a little historical context, like a part of my cacao project as well, it's bridging West Africa and, and um, Mesoamerica together because since the tree was growing first in uh, Central, uh, Central South America, um, a little history overview is that um, during the transatlantic slave trade, like the Spanish came over, the colonizers, and they were like, they didn't even like cacao at first. Like, actually, there's journals of Christopher Columbus's son saying how like they they saw these beans and they looked like almonds. They would call them almonds, and they saw how the indigenous at the time was like really protective over them, and they brought some back with them, and they didn't like it at first. People didn't like it. Like when they brought it back to Europe, they were like, it's only fit for pigs. That's what it actually said in the, in the journal. And so they started adding sugar, milk and stuff to it, making it taste better. Then it became like a, a, a royalty thing where only rich people can have it. So then when that I, when the boom happened, industrialization of cacao happened, and then they had to keep up production. But in Mesoamerica, South America, Central America, they didn't they didn't grow cacao in like plantations to keep up for demand, supply and demand. It was like wild grown cacao trees. You only take what you need, kind of thing we spoke about earlier. And then that was it. So then they started having this idea of like let's enslave the indigenous to to mass produce this. Didn't work. Diseases, everything killed off many of the indigenous, not to mention they just couldn't get it done. So what they did instead of bringing, they started bringing African slaves from West Africa to Central South America to also produce it. And then they realized that actually it's more cost effective to leave our slaves in West Africa and let's bring the cacao tree over there and grow it. So present day, over 72% of the world's chocolate comes from West Africa, comes from places like Ghana, Cote d'Ivoire, um, Nigeria, the whole West African region. And I actually just spoke about this with my cacao group um, yesterday in regards to the child labor and child slavery that still happens. It's estimated over 6 million children are involved with child slavery in the cocoa industry that involves Nestle and Cadbury and a lot of these things, a lot of accusations and Supreme Court things in America about it. Um, so this is all a fast food version of what it is that why, and this is setting us up for where you can buy it. Because I just wanted to give context of like, how it's really important to source ethically source intentional cacao from collectives. That's like that's 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 their livelihood. It's not going in corporate. And by any means, I'm like you know, it's you can't be perfect at times. If you eat a cookie that has a chocolate chip from somewhere, you can't source. Live your life, you know. Like you're still gonna have good karma. But this is just giving like like everybody listening, um, just a reality check on this. So there's a lot that goes into like the regular chocolate bars we see in the grocery stores. Like every time you see like a, a mainstream chocolate bar, you can 100,000% assume and bet your money that there's child labor that goes into that bar. And most of these kids who who make those, like harvest those cacao pods, they don't even know what chocolate tastes like. They're just doing it for people they'll never meet. Um, and last bit on this is that I get really fired up about this. You can see this is what my project's all about, bringing equality to the to the space. Um, let's say in 2020, it was estimated that cacao was a $100 billion industry. Ghana alone that produces most of the world's cocoa beans only saw $3.5 billion of that. 
out of a hundred dollar billion industry, hundred billion dollar industry. They only saw three and a half billion of that. So that shows you the inequality as well in that they're producing all this, then they ship it to Europe, to America, to these places. And then these chocolatiers are like, oh, the best chocolate comes from Switzerland. That's bullshit. The, it's, 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 it's actually, it's indigenous, it's African grown seeds, like uh, beans and stuff, because it's really important that we support indigenous growers, collectives that are owned by women, collectives that are owned by families in indigenous places. And the drinking cacao that we all love, it's, it mainly comes from Central and South America. Like that's where, because like, let's say Vanuatu, I know in Nigeria and Ghana, Uganda, they have cacao trees, but they don't process it to like drink it. They just eat the fruit and kind of just, you know, get rid of it. They don't go through the whole process. So store-bought cacao, I would say no. You know, I would say no. I would say find, I can leave resources with you for your audience as well. My, my project is not going to be launched until November. Um, where you can also source it through me. We work with regenerative farmers in Ecuador, in Dominican Republic, in Guatemala, in Mexico, Nigeria, and Ghana to bring to support all these families and teach them how to do bean to bar, but then also to, to so they can create more abundance for themselves and their communities. And supporting cacao. So it's like the average person, they'll see the price of a cacao. I know it's more for y'all in Australia. It'll be like 70, 80 bucks for like a, a kilo or something, like something crazy like that. But the thing is that the quality is 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 primo if you get it from a really good source. And you don't only have to drink it. Like you can also make moles. You can cook with it. Um, you can do, you could sprinkle it in your smoothies. Like you don't have to just drink a cacao and then cry like I do. You don't have to just do that. You can have it in other ways. Uh, more ways than than one. Oh wow! Okay, that's really good. Okay, so we have learned a lot. So make sure to find equitable sources and sustainable sources and fair trade, if anything. But also being able to directly purchase from a grower. I think that I can't wait, and I'm sure our audience can't wait to hear about your projects that you have in the pipeline. And we would like to obviously buy it from you. Um, that's probably something that we'll continue to educate our audience on. So please stay in touch. And I want to make sure that we uh, be able to share your work in that way. And I think that's amazing what you're doing to be able to help re-educate, you know, our population about cacao, because a lot of us don't really know, like we eat, we love chocolate, we eat chocolate every day. However, how it's grown and what type of facilities it's grown in and what part of the world and where it actually came from, Originally, I don't think a lot of people know. So I feel like, yes, there is definitely a TED Talk waiting for you to do. <laughs> um, so just like transiting a little bit like on, on, the, on the topic of, of intimacy and Tantra, because I think that's the only thing we haven't touched on yet in this interview. Because um, our audience are probably like, okay, what exactly is Tantra? Because there's a lot of ways. I, I've, I'm a yogi and I've studied a lot of the philosophies around the yoga and the traditions around the Vedic um, philosophies. And I know that Tantra is, is really a philosophy of how we live our life, right? A puri purity way, a purest way on how to commune with ourselves and the world around us. Now, Tantra has become a different topic these days. It has become, it's shifted and it's become a lot of different things. When you say you are a Tantra guide, what exactly does that conjure up in our minds and, and how can we, um, what can we, we, we can learn from your experiences on that front? Mm. So Tantra is a very, it's, it's, it's an umbrella term and it's uh, many Asian cultures, depending on where you go, have their own version of it. Um, yours, like through yoga and stuff, it's like yoga tantra is like a beautiful system and a guidance system on how to be present, how to fill your life with compassion, um, with presence, with um, with um, filling your life with um, with simplicity, you know. And this translates to us with emotions as well in our society, that it gives us also a guiding system to be able to to move through heavy emotions. A lot of people in our culture associate tantra with just sex, that it's sex-based, that it's, oh, kar karma sutra, or let's do this, or, you know, people misuse it as well for sexuality. But the true nature of Tantra is, is literally, it's innocence, it's compassion, it's presence, it's integrity and character. This is what Tantra really stands for. There are sexual aspects to it that are really beautiful. 
However, the the basis of it, it's it's prayer and devotion. My first experience with Tantra, it had nothing to do with sex, nothing. What it was, was 15 days of praying to deities with my mala beads, praying to the dakinis. That was my initiation into, into the, the my walk with Tantra, devotion, prayer, doing prostations. If you don't know what prostations are, prostations to your listening are, I call them Buddha, Buddha burpees. It's like, think about a burpee, but you're doing it prayer style, where it's like you're putting your head to the ground, you're, uh, you're putting your head, head to your hands to your head, you're coming up, giving reverence to something. That's what prostations are. So I was doing that um, as my initiation. It had nothing to do with sex. And then I asked my Rinpoche at the time, I was like, um, not in a disrespectful way, but I was like, what does this have to do with Tantra? And he just looked at me. He goes, there is no Tantra without discipline. And I was like, oh, I get it. Discipline is everything. And even for the monks, it's like a lot of monks don't learn tantric secrets until they have the discipline instilled. And this is the thing about our society. It's like we live in a fast food spirituality society where people just want things right away without, um, not necessarily we have to suffer for them, but you have to put in work with devotion and commitment and discipline to be able to achieve these things. Or it's like, what's the purpose of even having them if it's too easy, you know? So Tantra overall is just a system, a guidance system, a beautiful prayer for your life, for your walk, so you can stay present, so you can actually just be here and, and be whole, be wholesome in your experience with yourself and with all your loved ones and people around you. And and for those that are interested in doing more heart opening work, you know, we come to like a stage in our culture where we are so overwhelmed with social media. The first thing people do is just like wake up and go into their social media platforms and overwhelmed with information, left, right, center. And it allows us to, like you say, you know, sometimes we become numb. Like it doesn't really allow us to connect back into our heart space, into that present space, into that space where we can, we do know and know and have and want everything we want. Right. So how, in your opinion, how can people, mm come back to this, this sense of this connection with ourselves? I would say without even doing anything, just making an agreement with yourself, saying that I give myself permission to be messy, to be not put together, to not look a certain part, to not fake it till I make it, to actually just be real and raw with who I am right now in this moment. I feel that is the basic way to get into Tantra. Um, you can't fake it. It's, it's, it's what are you feeling right now? What are you dealing with? It's like, um, it's messy, you know? Like people want all the bells and whistles and spirituality. People want the, the, the crystals and they want all the things to, to look like a certain way. And it's like, if you read any book like, um, like Yogananda's book and you, you read all these, these, these literatures from these beautiful um, yoga philosophies, it's like these people were hardcore and raw in their expression and in their experience. You know, it's um, it's so giving yourself permission to not be put together, I would say, is the, the, the number one step into living a tantric lifestyle. Beautiful, beautiful. I think it's a really important message for especially women out there who we'll try to be everything, right? We want to be the most beautiful woman and the most, you know, physically, especially as we age and we want to be the best partners and the, the loving wives and at the same time, the best moms and, you know, being there for our children and also a career woman, you know, we want to be able to kick those goals and those milestones and we'll try to do it before we're 40. Okay. Right. And so it's like, we have so much that we need to be put together for all the time. So it's nice for you to say that. Thank you for the masculine to speak on that topic. And it's okay if we're not put together all the time. And it's okay to show our vulnerability. It's okay to show it's our okay. hearts. It's okay. That's all patriarchal pressure that we have to have it figured out. Yeah. So this has been a beautiful interview and we're coming to the end of it. And um, I think a lot of people are probably just wanting to see how they can connect with you um, and follow your work more. So if you'd like to share a little bit on that, feel free to do that on this podcast. Absolutely. You can find me on Instagram um, at Brendan Durrell, B-R-E-N-D-E-N-D-U-R-E-L-L. -L. 
Uh, my website's the same. And then also, um, you can also just um, join my newsletter. Like I've actually pulled back a lot from sharing a lot of myself on social media platforms, and I've pulled it to my email list to people who actually want to be there and receive some teachings and and different types of medicines from from what I have to share. Um, and then also with the with the community, uh, we didn't touch on this today, but I also bring people into the Amazon rainforest for an ecotourism regenerative travel project and. Um, I have one coming up very soon um, with men. So if ladies listening, if you your husband, sons, uncles, whatever, um, brothers, they, they want to be supported by men of integrity deep into the rainforest on an adventure, um, definitely send them my way. And then I'll be doing a co-ed one with, um, with men and women um, early next year as well. So beautiful, Brendan. Thank you so much for your time. And it's just been really a beautiful, meaningful and healing conversation. So thank you for all the work that you do and for spreading the message far and wide. Thank you so much. And I'll see you in Vanuatu very soon. I miss that place. <laughs> so yes, thank you everyone for listening. I really enjoyed that talk. I hope you did too. And there will be more of these on the Food Matters podcast. So head to foodmatters.com. And see you again.